The Holy Gospel from Matthew, the 18th chapter. Jesus continued, If a brother or sister sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If he or she listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the offender refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. When have you last heard that phrase? Probably at a church event of some sort, right? Maybe there was a Bible study or a meeting. Maybe it was something where only a couple people showed up. And then someone says, that's okay. Where two or three are gathered, Christ is there. Typically, we use this phrase to say that the church is wherever and however we gather, however many of us there are. We are imagining that it really says, for where two or three Christians are gathered to pray or study or worship or meet in my name, there I am. But you know what it really should say? It should say, for where two or three Christians are gathered to fight in my name, there I am. Because that, my friends, is the actual context and meaning of this sentence. This whole passage should sound pretty familiar to you. It's actually written into the church constitution of every congregation in the ELCA, which I'm sure you knew, right? Especially you council members, right? You've got that thing memorized, I'm sure. This passage is referenced in chapter 15 of our church constitutions, the section called Discipline of Members. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Basically, these words from Jesus have been used to create a process for dealing with conflict within the church. So here's what our constitutions prescribe based on this passage. If there's some kind of major problem between people, First, based on what Jesus says here and how we've interpreted it, you're supposed to seek private counsel and admonition by the pastor, then censure and admonition by the pastor in the presence of two or three witnesses. And if that doesn't resolve the problem, then there is a written referral of the matter by the council to the vice president of the synod, who will refer it to the consultation committee of the synod, and if that fails, then finally it is brought to the Committee on Discipline of the Synod. I'm sure you knew that that existed, right? And then they will decide the final resolution of the situation, whether the troublemaker stays or goes or whatever the end ends up being. Yikes, right? And it's not just us Lutherans who cite this passage, who use it for church matters, traditions across the globe turn to it for guidance in times of trouble. And as some of you know, and may have experienced yourselves, it isn't always used very well. At best, this process has ended with broken relationships, excommunication, and congregations or even entire denominations ripped apart. At worst, it is used to shame and humiliate those who are 
in the wrong in front of an entire church community. Somehow, I don't think any of that is what Jesus was talking about here. But it makes sense that this passage has been used that way, right? I mean, when Jesus says, let them be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, that sounds pretty harsh, right? But think about it. How did Jesus interact with Gentiles and tax collectors? Did he toss them out the door and cut off all contact? No. He sought out Gentiles and tax collectors, people that his people, the Israelites, didn't want anything to do with in the first place. Jesus talked to Gentiles, he shared meals with tax collectors, and he welcomed both as disciples and followers. Jesus didn't run them away or shut them out, even with their different opinions and cultures and social norms. Instead, he argued with them. He learned from them. And he better understood himself and his mission because of them. And then he opened his arms to them, promising that the kingdom of God that was promised in his life and his death truly was for all, for them too, even Gentiles and tax collectors. Jesus stayed engaged with those who were different from him, from those that his social group has la had labeled as different or weird or crazy. He committed 100% to his message and the community that gathered around him, differences and conflict and all. That is what Jesus is asking us to do too when we come together in his name. This isn't a passage about how to split up a church. This is a passage about how to hang together as a church. Choosing to do life together in Christian community is not always easy. There will be people who annoy us, bother us, and yes, offend us. And sometimes, yeah, there are legitimate times when someone needs to be asked to leave a community in situations of abuse or theft or other illegal behavior. But putting that extreme situation aside, think for a moment about why most people choose to leave a congregation. When it's not about simple things like moving away or maybe beliefs that have changed, I bet we'd find that people leave congregations primarily for one reason, conflict. Someone gets annoyed with someone else, things escalate, neither will budge, then maybe one side wins, so the other leaves. Sound familiar? We, as Christ followers, haven't been following his advice here very well. We've taken his words that focus on relationship and togetherness, and we've turned them into policy and used them instead for exclusion and separation. What Jesus is asking us for in our community together is much, much harder. He's asking his followers for honesty, for vulnerability, for courage, accountability, and commitment. He's asking us to tell our brothers and sisters in Christ when they have done something that has hurt us or offended us, not just pretend it didn't happen. And he's asking us to give each other lots and lots of grace lots of chances to turn things around. Some of you are familiar with the message translation of the Bible written by Pastor Eugene Peterson. He rewrites the end of this passage to go like this. If he, the offender, still won't listen, tell the church. If he won't listen to the church, you'll have to start over from scratch, confront him with the need for repentance, and offer again God's forgiving love. Take this most seriously. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven. A no on earth is a no in heaven. What you say to one another is eternal. 
I mean this. When two of you get together on anything at all on earth and make a prayer of it, my Father in heaven goes into action. And when two or three of you are together because of me, you can be sure that I'll be there. It is our relationships and our communities and our commitments to those things that matter to Jesus. What he wants for us is a true, real, deep community. One where we can be honest with each other, where we can let each other know when we've been hurt and how we can make it better for each other, where we dare to be that honest and that vulnerable with our fellow believers. And a community that commits 100% to following Christ as best we can together each and every day, even in our mistakes and our failings and our fallings, because those will happen, we all know. It's possible. Even with the people that annoy the heck out of us. And we can trust that wherever two or three are gathered, in conflict, in vulnerability, in shared striving for renewed relationship, Christ is there. Right there in the middle of it all. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. <laughs>